It's preparing to stream, folks. So just a few minutes here. Oh, it is. Mm -hmm. So we just got to wait for you to fully get on there. Right. I wish we could do this before the meeting starts. Yes. <laughs> hey, no worries. You guys just got to listen to me run through my spiel again. Okay, now I just need to mute. Correct. And mute is at the bottom, isn't it? No, it should be close to like a third of the way down, I think. You'll see just the little um, bell-shaped thing and you'll want to click on that. To, like the Bell-shaped bell thing? Yeah, kind of like the mute button type thing. When you okay. click on it, it'll close it. Okay, here. It'll, in, or it'll mute it. Are you getting any feedback? I'm not, maybe it is muted. It might be. So then we just need to record the meeting. Mm-hmm. Okay. Bring it up. Yeah, there's no feedback. So I must have unwittingly made it work. And now I'm Perfect. gonna record Then we're good. All right. Record uh, on this computer, you said, not to the cloud. Correct. Okay, got it. We're, we're live now. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Foe. We're ready to go now. Yeah, no, it's all good. No worries. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 22nd of March, 2021 City of DuPont Planning Commission meeting. My name is Jeff Foe and I'm the chair of the Planning Commission. And for the benefit of those individuals listening via YouTube and Zoom, the Planning Commission is a body of volunteer citizens who serve as advisors to the mayor and to the city council. Our delegated authority is to maintain the city's comprehensive plan and the land use code consistent with the Washington Growth Management Act. Meetings of the Planning Commission are open public meetings and they are being recorded. There is an opportunity for members of the community to address the Planning Commission. Instructions on how to make a public comment are on the city's website. So Ms. Howell, if you'd go ahead and conduct the roll call. Yes, gladly. Oh, yes ma'am. Uh, did Commissioner Jackson, did I see you raise your hand? No, I was just waving when Jeff said hello. Oh, no. <laughs> sorry about that. That's perfect. Okay, so let's commence here. Okay, Chair Foe. Present. Thank you. Um, Commissioner or Vice Chair Rylander. And he's absent tonight. That is correct. He asked to be excused, so that's all good. Commissioner Thakor. Here. Thank you. Commissioner Jackson. Here. Commissioner Thank Burnett. You. I'm here. Commissioner Colvin. Here. Commissioner Scow. Here. Commissioner Jones. Here. Great, thank you all. Awesome, thanks, Janet. Next item on the agenda would be approval of the agenda. So a motion would be in order to so approve. I'll make that motion to approve the uh, agenda. Thank you, Mr. Colvin. Is there a I'd like to second that. Okay, Mr. Jackson, thank you for the second. Is there any discussion on the agenda? Hearing no comments, why don't we go ahead and vote uh, to approve the agenda for this evening. Those in favor, raise your hand and say aye in front of the camera. Aye. 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 And those opposed, say nay. Okay. Motion carries unanimously. Okay, next item on the agenda would be to approve the minutes from the meeting of 8th March, 2021. So a motion would then be in order. Mr. Jackson. I so move. Perfect. Second. Is there a second? Mr. Colvin, thank you for the second. Is there any discussion in terms of uh, the meeting minutes from the 22nd? Hearing no discussion, let's go ahead and give it a vote. Those in favor, 
wave to the camera and say aye. 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 And those opposed, say nay. The ayes have it unanimously. The motion is carried. The vote is passed. Okay, next item on the agenda is unfinished business. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Director Kincaid and she's gonna walk us through some wireless communication facility stuff. Is, is this okay? Let me share my, um, did, you say, um, did you say unfinished business? I'm sorry. Uh, I, I did, yep, five okay. points. Okay, excellent. So I'm going to share my screen and um, and we're going to just start the work that we need to do on the WCF code. There we go. How does that look? Can you see that? Yes, looks nice. Yeah, it looks okay. good. Let me put the slide part of it up. That makes it a little bigger. There we go. Okay, so um, as I as I indicated. Uh, earlier that um, the this section of code it it, it lives in uh, the D DMC chapter twenty five one two five and what we will need to do is a complete rewrite of that section of code so um, you know there's no no way to show you reasonably a you know a strike through underlined version because it's all going to be and newly formatted and new, newly written. So the first slide that you see here on the left box um, is the basically the sections. Take you know, think of that as the table of contents um, of the adopted the city's adopted code ordinance for the W the wireless communication facility WCF. I always have to do, go through the words to get the acronym the uh, abbreviation right, but the WCF code as adopted, just to show you how much different uh, it's going to be, the left side is, is what we have currently in our table of contents and the right is what that will look like. So a lot of a uh, lot more to it than what we have. You can see it's fairly bare bones as it exists now. And as we talked about at previous meetings um, with the uh, FCC, uh, federal communications changes to the rules, um, everybody in the um, you know, United States, this isn't even just a Washington state thing, needs to update their, their code language to be consistent with those new federal rules. So that is to show you when you actually get the draft of the whole new chapter, um, you know, that's what that's gonna look like. And, uh, and so there's just to compare it to what we have currently, um, you can see a whole lot, a whole lot more meat to it than present. So what I thought we would do also is um, the adopted purpose statement. Um, again, it's what we have now is just these three things: purpose of this chapter, um, and it just talks about locating the wireless in non-residential areas. Uh, minimizing the total number of freestanding WCFs through co-location, minimizing visual impact. So that's what we have now. And this is the proposed uh, beginning of the proposed that we'll be walking through. And, and please stop me at any time. Um, this is going to be somewhat dry and I apologize. Um, but the thought is that as we, we can just kind of go through together as a group, and then when you have the whole draft rewrite in front of you um, and we start really discussing that, it'll, it'll, it, it'll be familiar, I guess, for lack of a better term. So the new purpose, now we've added a, a title and a purpose um, and uh, it's the wireless communications, but you can see the purpose and intent gets to be more legalese than we had before. Um, it's, uh, so the intent is now broader and it's to implement those new federal rules. That's what number one and number two is about. Um, the number three in the proposed is, is similar. We're trying to establish appropriate locations, site development standards, permit requirements, um, and services in the city. 
and um, in a manner here that facilitates the there various types of WCFs in permitted locations. Uh, we talk about, you know, that we want them to be within consistent with the residential character of the city. Um, that this chapter is going to provide for managed uh, development and installation, maintenance and removal. Um, all of this language uh, that you see is just um, is just broader, not as general and more focused on uh, really on complying or being consistent with those new federal rules. So then you have a section C that goes into the requirements of the chapter, which is very um, similar to what we just discussed, but it gets down, it narrows the focus down to ensuring compatibility with surrounding areas, um, specifically location, height, um, structural integrity review, you know, all that stuff. It's just more, more focused. Um, sustaining our peaceful character. So this, this explains um, in more detail what we're, what we're trying to achieve with this ordinance. And these standards, we don't want uh, WCFs to have noise that's gonna disrupt people or vibrations or lights. Um, we wanna be able to encourage the location of towers in non-residential areas. And we want to minimize the total number of towers. Notice it says towers now, um, rather than the, the old language said, and co-location. Um, but then in four, we're encouraging the co-location um, to um, on existing towers. So we kind of pulled that apart and said, OK, well, really, we, uh, we don't want new towers in non-residential areas. And we want to, you know, be able to minimize that because of the impact, obviously, to the residential communities. And then in four, we're going to, um, wherever it's possible, um, as we administer this code, we're going to be encouraging the co-location um, on, on existing sites because we want to sort of minimize. That's the way that we're going to minimize the number of new towers. Um, we want to five effectively manage those in the public rights of way. And um, we talk about number six, reducing uh, maybe the, the visual apparent perceived number of them, um, providing incentives or other inducements to use co-location and camouflage design techniques. Um, so that's all language that would be in the new uh, proposed draft that you'll be seeing for the purpose, basically the purpose statement for the purpose part. Then, the, and this is a brand new uh, section that was did not previously exist at all, is all of those definitions. And, um, and so I'm gonna kind of run through them. I don't want us to spend a ton of time because then I'll be giving you this draft language and we'll be talking about it in two weeks. Um, I think the thing that's most important as we develop these definitions is that you you all weigh in about whether or not it's clear the de definition is is a good definition or if it seems a little ambiguous if you were reading this as a lay person you know you would have no idea what what we were trying to say to you that's that's the way that i re re reading it because i'm not a you know telecommunication wireless specialist either and so that's, I think, the lens that we ought to be reading these definitions through and thinking, okay, if I were, you know, if I were trying to figure out, you know, what, what we're talking about here, does this make sense? So these are alphabetical order, um, and it's in its own new section of code. In it would be, you know, in the title 25, 25125020. And we start out with defining what accessory equipment means. And you can, how, how easily is it for you to read, to read these words on this PowerPoint? Is it pretty small on your screen? No, it's acceptable. It's good. Oh, I mean, good, I good. Excellent. So we, we, we've got accessory cause I won't read verbatim, but accessory equipment, you know, any equipment serving or being used in conjunction with wireless, to, you know, does that, as you're reading that, does that, does, that makes sense to everybody, that definition, you understand what we're saying, or does it need to be, or do we need to uh, massage a little bit? 
clear to me. Very clear. Yeah, okay. By me as well. And then we go into abandoned. Um, and you can see I have a line there not uh, with a notwithstanding definition found in. I need to go through the code and find out if we have any other. The thing when you're writing definitions and you're putting certain definitions in one chapter um, where you're regulating, you may have a conflicting uh, definition in another chapter. So that's why you see this under B abandoned where I have some question marks. I don't know if we have any other definition in the code where we talk about where we define something that's abandoned, but I'll, I'll check that. I hadn't checked that yet, but basically we wanna say that for the purpose of this particular chapter, we're defining abandoned um, an abandoned wireless telecommunications facilities use is going to be abandoned if it's not in use for six consecutive months. Um, and th these are these are um, these are definitions that we pulled from other city codes. Um, and so six months seems to be sort of a standard. I, I can't really tell you why six months, why that pops up in other codes. Um, but that seems to be what what people are saying. You know, if you're if you've got a, a tower or something and, and it hasn't been used for six months, then it, then as we get further into the code, that would be considered ban abandoned, and it and it could be required. The removal could be required. So C, whoops, <clears throat> C accessory wireless communication antenna, um, ground mounted, which could also you could also use the word freestanding or building mounted, which you could also use the word attached. And it's an antenna for um, basically, you know, residents, business people, property owners um, to be able to uh, transmit or receive communications or data. Um, so types, then we go into the different types because you're thinking, wow, that's pretty broad. That's any old antenna. You know, you think about your, if you're old enough to remember having rabbit ears on your TV, you know, that was an antenna to get your TV station. But um, we have these categories then defined as a category one is a radio and television receive only antenna, which would be your AM, FM radio kind of antenna. So we talk about um, or dish not, um, not exceeding 39.4 inches in diameter, usually supported by a single pole, poster mast, uh, antenna height not exceeding 15 feet above grade, or freestanding ant antennas or 10 feet above the height of the building um, upon which it's mounted. So that's kind of the first, the, the low grade and why this will be important later on is because we'll be regulating these different categories of antenna differently. So the B category two is like your amateur radio antenna, your ham radio. Um, so you're sending and receiving citizen band radio antennas of you know, similar antennas by federally licensed amateur ham radio operators at their homes. So this says, you know, this is another type of antenna um, that will have some restrictions on it, but, um, but it breaks it down into a, another classification, if you will, for how we want to regulate them. So we're not regulating, it's not one size fits all when we're talking about antennas. Um, you see I've got highlighted there, except uh, that last sentence, except as provided otherwise in the DMC 251250070F, that's where our next meeting, we're gonna be getting into the permitted locations and designs. So that's a, crop, that's a, res, a, a citation that references something that is to come. Um, and then the category threes, accessory mobile antenna device, uh, that is um, GPS equipment, mobile radio, television antennas, which are less than 12 inches in height or width, excluding the support structure. And D is the category four, your minor telecommunication antenna. Um, sending and receiving da data or communication could be a dish um, other than the one and two, and also 
kind of the same diameter, 39.4 inches in diameter, single pole, post, mast, and then you have 15 with an antenna height not exceeding 15 feet above grade for freestanding antennas. So these are the kinds of different antennas that um, that are, I guess, you, you know, they're 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 we're not talking about the the big the big W uh, wireless communication WCFs. These are things that people um, sometimes have as hobbies or ham radio, or they have um, may come in with asking to be able to construct to have an antenna placed on their home or or something. So that's the accessory. So that's why it's called out as an accessory. Then D is where we're getting into, you know, the big, the big, uh, the bigger stuff, I guess, for lack of a better word. But where you've got D is antenna. This is no longer an accessory. This is the system of poles, panels, rods, discs. These are all used for the transmission or reception of radio frequency signals. Again, you see this highlight because we'll be bringing in uh, illustrations um, of the different types of antenna. But these types of antenna include, but are not limited to, you see the A, B, and C, um, the omnidirectional, known as a whip antenna. I'm actually still trying to find a picture of that. A directional antenna, known as a panel antenna, and parabolic antenna, uh, which we know is that I do know, I recognize that one, it's a dish antenna. So these are the kinds of antennas in D that one would see on a, um, you know, on a, a big, big pole that, that we think of when we think of as a uh, WCF, basically. But ultimately all of the, even the little accessory and hobby things are, are different types. You know, they contain different types of antenna because they're also sending, transmitting and receiving data. So it's important that we make sure that we are clear about what we're regulating um, in these definitions. Then you go into E uh, where you have a definition for attached wireless communication facility. That's going to tell us if we have an application coming in for review, if it's, an, it's a, fi a fix to an existing structure. So that example could, uh, could be a communication facilities antenna that's, um, that's erect, affixed or, or you know, attached to an existing building, to a water tank, or some structure. And um, F is base station. We're defining that a base station includes any structure other than a tower that supports or housing equipment, other structure, other than a tower that supports or houses, that's a typo, houses equipment in a fixed location that enables wireless communications licensed or authorized between user equipment and communications network. That's a lot. Um, as an illustration and uh, not a limitation, the FCC's definition refers to any structure that actually supports wireless equipment, even though it was not originally intended for that purpose. Um, and thank goodness I found some examples because I was a little lost in F. And if you are, please let me know and I'll continue to try to make that more um, user friendly. But the examples are um, mounted on buildings, utility poles, transmission towers, light standards, or traffic signals. So those are all types of base stations. Um, but it, that, that definition does not encompass a tower as defined in this chapter or any equipment associated with a tower. But see that, that, I'm reading this back to you and I'm thinking I'm kind of lost in this. Are you lost in this one for base station? Yeah, th th there's a lot of information there. And, uh, there is, yeah. I think I need more work on that one, don't you? Yeah, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And so G, co-location, that means placing or installing, integrating, oops, look at that typo, integration of wireless telecommunication facilities. 
including antennas and related equipment, so onto an existing authorized wireless to telecommunication facility in the case of monopoles or on the same building. Um, so co-location, that one, I, I am pretty solid that I understand that, you know, if someone is coming in to co-locate, they're telling me that they're going to put something on something that already exists. It's an antenna um, and they're not, they're not starting out with their new pole supporting pole for this. Uh, an equipment shelter or cabinet, a room cabinet or building used to house equipment. That one was pretty easy. Um, I, fully concealed facilities. That's where we're talking about a facility that's designed and constructed to blend in with the surrounding environment. Um, so the antenna and related equipment are not readily visible. And this could be putting a wireless facility inside a cupola on a building where you wouldn't see it, um, hiding it in a, behind a water tank. Uh, you see those artificial trees. I just found an, an illustration where they had it. Um, it was an American flag. It was pretty neat. You really didn't even know it was a, a tower actually for a, a wireless facility. So these are where when we're talking about a fully concealed facility, that's the that's what we're talking about in this definition. J, the freestanding wireless, um, that's a, it's a facility that's affixed to a some, some type of support. So it could be on the ground. Um, the examples include antennas installed on lattice or monopole towers with or without guys. And there's more definition about um, support structures later on in the, in, as we get down a little further on the definitions. Uh, K, we have uh, height, and I said in this one, the purpose of this chapter, because we have uh, land use, you know, design standards in the land use code that have different height dimensional standards, but we wanted to be clear that um, we're talking about measuring the height for a wireless facility um, from the distance from the ground level to the highest point on that facility that we're including the antenna or whatever equipment is attached to that antenna. Um, and apparently there's uh, some that they actually can crank up. Uh, so then you would be measuring at the highest, the highest level that it could be raised on that type. Um, L, we needed to define what a modification was. And so um, modification is uh, co-location modification or replacement of transmission equipment at an existing wireless tower or base station that doesn't result in substantial, um, I'm not gonna move my thing over, excuse me, in substantial change in the physical dimensions of the existing wireless tower or base station. And then you have this um, pursuant to this language here that um, is consistent with the, uh, with the codified uh, code, federal code. Um, it can be, so, and also that it could be interpreted or amended, that federal code could be. So um, we also define what a substantial change is when we get to the S's. Um, but this is just simply saying, what do we, what, when someone says they just want to do a modification, how do we, how do we interpret a modification? How do we define what that is? So that's what L is about. And in M, uh, we, I put this definition of public right of way in because um, the code, as far as I could tell, we didn't have any definition in land use title 25. And a lot of, um, you know, a lot of the wireless facilities are, the, you know, proposed to be in public right of way. So we're saying a public right of way is any public highway, street, alley, sidewalk, parkway, all extensions or additions, um, either owned or operated or controlled by the city, subject to an easement or dedication to the city, um, or is privately owned area within the city's jurisdiction, which is not yet dedicated, and that's important, but is designated as a proposed public right-of-way. 
So this gives this language covers us if we have a um, preliminary plat application. We've we've given preliminary approval on a on a plat or a subdivision, and there is um, area there that's already um, it's not finaled yet, but it's already you know understood that there would be this area of an easement or a dedicated right of way. Um, at that at that point in this chapter, we're saying now it's now it's defined as public right of way, even though it may not be legally transferred yet. Um, so in then related equipment is all equipment and ancillary ancillary to the transmission and reception of voice and data. Such equipment may include, but is not limited to cable, conduit, connectors, equipment pads, equipment shelters. Okay, so that's all this accessory or related equipment that we, um, we wanted to make sure we were defining what that is. O, a roof or a building mounted sign is defined as a, you know, located on a rooftop or a building. It has no support structure of its own such as a mono monopole or some type of tower. P, we get into what's a substantial change. And this is from the FCC rules, um, wireless towers outside of public right of way, a substantial change occurs when the proposed co-location or modification um, does any of these things, these four things. It increases the overall height of more than 10%, or the height of one additional antenna array, not to exceed 20 feet, whichever is greater, or it might uh, be increasing the width more than 20 feet from the edge of the tower, or the width of the tower at the level of the appurtenance, whichever is greater, or it could involve the installation of more than the standard number of equipment cabinet cabinets, which is four, it can't exceed four, um, and Number four, if, if, it, if the proposal involves excavation or groundwork outside of the area in proximity to the existing structure, um, that could also be considered a substantial change. And why this is important is, um, is because the way that the new rules are, we, we have more authority to uh, bring in new ways to regulate, like say maybe concealment, if you have an existing uh, facility, you, you can't, it's just like when you adopt a new land use ordinance and everything is, you know, we think of it as the old stuff is grandfathered in. You can't go back and retro, you know, these, you've already, you've already approved something. That's the same way uh, to think about this. You've got a wireless facility, facility, it's permitted, fine. You don't, we, nobody likes it, but you can't do anything about it unless they come in with a substantial change. And that's why we've defined what that is in, in, um, and done it consistent with the new federal rules. As you can imagine, there was a lot of, I'm sure there was a lot of problems and that's what facilitated all this change in the, in the rulemaking. We also have it's substantial if it involves, oops, that's a, I double pasted you there. Um, the proximity, the groundwork, but then also a proposed modification. If it defeats the concealment elements, of the tower or base station, that could be substantial. Um, or if uh, the, the proposed co-location or modification actually violates a prior condition of approval, that could be considered substantial. So those are the six things then that, um, that would allow us as a city to have some authority to, um, to ask for, you know, maybe you can conceal this or maybe you can do something differently um, because it would be, they would be asking to do something substantially different from what had already been approved. So then Q, WCF related equipment, it's all the equipment that's ancillary to the transmission and reception. Okay, it's, I think that's actually, in my mind, that's a duplication um, because we have that accessory language. So that may not even be necessary, it could be overkill. Um, our wireless communications facility is defined as a public or private land use that consists of equipment installed for the purpose of providing wireless transmission, all these things. Um, and it goes on to say that this equipment includes antennas, 
you know, all the whole gamut of what, what we're talking about of, on the equipment for a wireless communications facility. Um, but we also say, but it doesn't include, so a wireless te telecommunications facility is, is, we're not defining it. It doesn't include radio or television broadcast or radio communication systems for government or emergency services. So this is sort of your exemption language in the definition that you'll see um, later on in the um, in the code language. Uh, then you have S wireless communication support. This is where I was saying earlier where we talk about the different kinds of towers. Um, a tower is freestanding. Um, it's supported. It's built to support the antennas and the, all the connecting appurtenances. I'm going to try to find illustrations to put in the code to help people understand um, what these different support structures or towers look like. Um, but they're typically going to be A, B, or C, a lattice tower, a monopole tower, or a guide tower. Those are the three that, um, that are being constructed. Oops. And so that was the end of our definitions chapter. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And so we're really just starting to think about this, this whole thing about what are we talking about? Um, so as you know, for the next meeting, then what you'll be getting in your materials is, is what we just went over with some more, um, we'll go more into the code, but as you're reading it at, you know, there's, there's, you don't need to, you know, we don't need to spend a lot of time talking or wordsmithing, but just like I said, the lens is, does this make sense, you know, to all of us that um, very few people know, you know, unless they're a telecommunication specialist, they're, they don't, we don't know what this stuff means. So it's important for us to be complete and thorough in the definition, but also um, and not ambiguous, and also make it so that uh, the lay person and the people that are administering the code, the people that are applying for a permit, all understand um, those definitions. So that is all I have in that introductory um, section for that part of our agenda. Well, that was very informative. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. That's right. I think uh, it's a very good detailed information and initial information, but I think uh, it just spells out a lot of things very well. No, oh, thank you. Any other comments? Okay, moving right along on the agenda. Next is uh, item 5.2, it's the uh, amendments to the Planning Commission's Rules of Procedures. And did everybody get a chance to take a look at uh, some of the changes we made from last week? Outstanding. And does anybody have any other further questions, comments? So, I think the last meeting, I was a uh, little hesitant about one of the, I forgot what was that number. <laughs> it is on page eight and nine. So uh, it was five, six. That's correct. Eight, and six. So after I read it, uh, I think uh, the suggestions in the blue looks great. I think we'll go with that suggestion. Yeah, basically, and just uh, we're we're deleting uh, bullets one and two, and then it's uh, the edit on uh, bullets three, and so it'll just be a one paragraph. Is everybody good with that? Okay, great. So just I want to make sure that I understand. So three, we're definitely we're getting rid of one and two. Three yep. reads letters to the editor interviews or other communication of personal opinions by a planning commission member. Um, we had should, will, and may. 
be presented to the full planning commission prior to publication so that the planning commission members may be aware. Now, are we keeping all of that language or we're striking that one? Uh, I think replacing it with this planning commission is an advisory body. Are we completely replacing the language that we drafted in three with the um, uh, with this paragraph? The planning commission is an advisory body or no member is- I, I read it. My interpretation was is that uh, what was written in Bolles three would remain, okay, and, and then keep keep the note uh, okay. underneath it, you know, because that just provides more clarity, more information. Great. Does Does anybody have a, a differing opinion? Yeah, I, I I personally think that three should be stricken, um, and then replaced with that note. Um, you know, because I mean, I mean, personally, uh, you know, us being on a planning commission, we, we, um, we do have, we are a public figure, but to say what we can and can't, or, or to tell us what we can and can't say, uh, without somebody else's permission is pretty close to stepping on, um, you know, first amendment rights in my opinion, um, you know, telling me that I, I can't say something um, or, you know, that, and, and I, I get that, you know, maybe if I want to make some, make a statement that, you know, more eyes uh, on it um, is better than just my own, you know, so in case I, 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 you know, would potentially say something harmful or that could, but by the same token, uh, if I want to make a statement and I got to bring it to the planning commission. That means I have to have it planned out days, maybe weeks in advance before I actually give it and then get the approval of the planning commission and then actually be out. So it would be a painful process that I think even if it was in the uh, rules, it would probably be one of those rules that was um, bypassed. You know, people wouldn't use because, you know, when you throw in that may um, or should, that means it gives you the option. And if it's painful, why do it? I'll just, do, you know, why go through the process? I'll just do it. Um, that, that's kind of my, my viewpoint. Yeah, it, I, I hear you. And I, and I think what, what the purpose of uh, Bull Ace 3 is so that it does give you that right to free speech, but yet what it does to use a military term is it establishes the hierarchy of command, right? And, and so, because if one of you all go out and make a statement in, in sense, you're talking on my behalf and on the mayor's behalf, okay? Pr prior to uh, having his approval. I mean, cause we all, we all work for the mayor. And, and so, what, what this does is it gives us a mechanism, I think, to elevate to the mayor, to get his thumbs up and say, yep, no problem. Is it, Director Kincaid, what, uh, what are your thoughts? I can see it both ways, actually. Um... I mean, I, I, I really, I don't, I, doesn't matter I've, to me. I'm not, uh, it, one way or the other is fine. It seems like three, when I read it, it's uh, it's um, like a courtesy thing. You know, if you're going to go out there yeah. and start talking about, you know, what you think as a citizen, and, you know, it, it would be sort of a, but then I, I don't know. I, I guess I am leaning towards striking three and just, having um, under five, six planning commission representation, just this uh, paragraph, the planning commission is advisory. No member should be positioned to appear and leave it like that. I, I think, I feel like that's, it's. I'd it's, like to encourage you to follow up on that feeling. I think that's the correct thing to do. Just, just the one section as, as commissioner Coven suggested. So just the item in the note. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. That's my that's my thought too. Um, 
Okay, that's good. It, you know, so, so I'm just, I, um, I tend to agree too that, I mean, if you're looking at that and the, especially because we are, we are volunteers, we are not voted in, we are not paid. So technically we are not in, in our own private opinions, we are not, um, we are not governed by the city. Um, and I think when we designate that, I don't think when it's your own personal opinion, as long as it doesn't come up in any way I'm representing, which we cover, you're not representing the planning commission, you're not representing the city, you're representing your right as a, um, as a private citizen that I, it does fall into a kind of a, a it could go down a hole if we're having to get, even if it's called a courtesy, we shouldn't need to express our personal opinions in, in the council and then, or in, you know, the commission and what do you think and all that, because yeah. then all of a sudden it's not your personal opinion anymore. It's the opinion of everybody else in the planning commission. So as that, long as it explicitly says, um, as long as we cover, you are never to represent the, the commission, which we cover. I don't think that bringing in personal, as long as it is very specific personal opinion, it, it shouldn't need any kind of approval from the planning committee. That's just me. I, I completely concur with both, uh, uh, both uh, Councilman uh, and Commissioner Colvin, as well as Commissioner Shu uh, in this regards. You know, we, we should not have a constraint on our, on, on our freedom to be able to express uh, our, our opinion as a citizen, as long as we are not doing it uh, in an official capacity as a commissioner. We are, uh, as Commissioner Shu mentioned, we, we, we are volunteers. And yes, although we do represent the city, we also still are citizens of the city too as well. So Great discussion. Like a, yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, you're you're fine, ma'am. I was just. I, it uh, sounds like you're all agreeing to um, strike three and then under five six, just have that language. I think that's what I'm hearing. Yeah, I would Roger that. Okay. Definitely, definitely, you're hearing that from me. Yes. <laughs> So then what I'll do is I'll make that last change and then I will um, pass this along to uh, the mayor because the, the mayor needs to be on board with what we're proposing to change. And then, um, you know, I'll, I'll come back to you and um, the next steps will basically be, and he's already sort of been apprised of this is what we're talking. Oh, excuse me. Commissioner Thackford? Yes, so I'm good with that. But I just, uh, before we end this, I just wanted to con just get some clarification because I'm just new. And uh, so on a 8.3, it says the removal of member. The mayor has a full authority to remove a planning commission member. And also, so is that a city council has to, I'm sorry, but when I was a applying for the position, I was told that city council has to approve it. So do they have to approve the removal also or not? Just a clarifying question. The way the, that's a really great question. So the mayor has the authority to, um, you know, to, to select and deselect a planning commissioner. And what he does is brings the actual confirmation of the appointment to council. But I do not believe the intent is for him to also have to bring forward to council um, if he determines that a commissioner should no longer serve. I believe that's the intent of the way it's written. Um, I could certainly go back and make sure that that's clarified with the mayor um, because I could be wrong, obviously. 
Yeah, I just, uh, it's just uh, wondering because I, when uh, say we applied, uh, at least especially when I applied, it says that it has to go through the city council and council has to approve it. So if you are adding and you need approval, then if you are removing, do we need an approval? Yeah, I, I don't believe that's the intent, but I will clear, I will uh, confirm that and bring that information back to you. I think whenever there's a, um, Whenever there's an appointment made to any board or committee or commission, um, the mayor so selects these people and then um, asks the, uh, the council to basically uh, confirm his selection. Um, but typically, I, I don't think that it works the other way, but I will definitely make sure that, um, that that's true and that I'm correct. And I will come back to you um, in two weeks with that. So we can, so if, if that needs to be, if that also needs to be revised the way that 8.3 is written, we can do that or clarified in that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so then once we get past, you know, we're comfortable with the revisions, mayor's comfortable with the revisions, then what I need to do is, these are, these are your rules that you adopt but I have to take an ordinance forward because um, because your rules, parts part of your rules, like the the number of meetings and things like that, that's codified in the in the DMC. So I will have to make sure that I'm bringing forward an ordinance that's amending the section of code um, to reflect the adopted changes in your rules. So that's how that that plays out. So that's um, that's great. So I will um, I'll make that change that we talked about. I'll double check myself on eight three, and um, so we're pretty good shape with this uh, revision on this these rules, and they sure are a lot better than they were. Does anybody correct? Yeah, Roger that. No worries. Does anybody else have any other comments on uh, uh, this document thus far? Yeah, I, I would like to say um, regarding um, Commissioner uh, Thackworth's comment about 8.3, I am completely in agreement. Um, and the re one of the issues I see with it as it is written right now is because the commission or the, the mayor can, um, you know, select somebody, but the uh, uh, city council is the one that approves. Um, there's no reason why uh, the, the mayor would be able to just remove somebody off the planning commission that he didn't want and then just start throwing people at the uh, city council to approve. And not saying that the mayor could do that, but with 8.3 being where the mayor alone can remove somebody, then it does give at least that perception. It, so, so just again, I want to agree with, um, with Commissioner Colvin. Uh, this this commission specifically, or this planning commission specifically, has had similar friction points in this regard in prior uh, administrations, uh, you know, uh, with mayors being able to remove individuals indiscriminately. So mm -hmm. um, I, I, would, I would also agree that if the council um, is it, supposed to be the body that actually approves the mayor's recommendation, then vice versa, it should also be you know, the mechanism that's used to remove a commissioner. Not that any of us are going to do anything that it's going to be, um, that, that, that's going to warrant that. We do, in, in many regards, work at the discretion of the mayor and, and our intent here is to advise him. But at the same time too, we, this city has had friction with this before in the past. And so um, we need to be careful with how we tread if we're going to enact regulation and rules that allow one individual to make the sole choice. Well, just remember too. Yeah. Yep. It may, not, it may not be up to us. You know, I mean, we we all work for a boss. You know, and and this sounds very similar to you know uh, our own executive. So, you know, just some food for thought. But it was definitely a good catch, and this is great because we do want these uh, rules to be um, to be, you know, good rules, and and make sure that it's um, carrying out the intent of, you know, the 
the institution that we're all part of. So that's great. Is there anywhere it says in the document, I tried to find it, but uh, that uh, city council has to approve or other way around? So it talks about the, um, so, so my understanding, and again, this is something that we can, I can check myself and come back. My understanding is that it's more of a confirmation than an approval. I know that sort of word smithy, but there is a little nuanced difference there. Um, and that the, the mayor is actually making the selection, if you will, but that his selection is affirmed by the council. So it's very, very you know, I don't, I don't know, but there is a little bit of a difference there. But let me go back and um, and talk to uh, Andy Takata, the city administrator, and the mayor, and and will, and I can bring you better information at our next. It, this it. document is our procedures about yeah. what we do, and that is somebody else's procedures about how we get here. So it wouldn't be appropriate in this document, I don't Good think. Point. Good point. Maybe it just belongs in the code, yeah, in the DMC and not in this document. So maybe, yeah. Okay, well, we still have more work to do. A little more to do. Yeah, very good point that this is actually, once you're in the, once you're on the committee, this isn't necessarily how you get to the committee. So maybe that is more city code than the planning commission policies, so. Very good point. So we much, might want to just remove that eight three at all together, and I'll just check what the what the ordinance reads because it's that's the city's ordinance about um, adding and removing planning commission members. But I, I, you know, we're getting close. We just need a little more work on this, I guess. So other way to also think about it is like say we are appointed for four years, and say the mayor gets changed in say next two years and then mayor says okay i don't like any of you you all are out <laughs> so that happens to community development directors all the time <laughs> i think they call that good to be the king <laughs> yep okay then we uh we will this will be on your agenda in two weeks because we're not quite done with it then thank you this very good very good discussion. I appreciate all the work you're putting into this. Yeah, right on everybody. Good job. Okay, so I don't believe there's any new business uh, to discuss tonight. Um, and so do we have any uh, public comment? Anybody from the public out there that would like to be recognized? And I don't see either Director Kincaid or Miss Hold standing up saying, yep, we got a lot of people out there. No, nobody. Mm -mm. Okay. All right. No, I, so, I did not receive any um, emails or any messages. No. Perfect. Makes it easy. Um, and there's no administrative reports for this evening? Nope. Okay. Any other uh Planning Commission member comments. Anybody want to comment about anything we've talked about tonight? I do. I want to just comment that we had this debate in 1789 uh, when we passed the Constitution, and it said that President got to appoint these cabinet members. And, and they had a big debate about, after that was ratified, about whether that meant he could fire them when he wanted to. Um, and I have a two hour lecture I give in my class about that. But, but the end result was he can fire anybody. He can fire them if he wants to. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Jackson. I was going to call on you to give us that little bit of the executive branch, you know, that, what his powers consist of, just to remind us. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yep. Very good. Well, everyone, I certainly appreciate everybody's uh, participation. Uh, I think we're, we're moving and grooving. So 
I don't have anything further unless there's uh, any alibis. All right, everybody have a wonderful couple of weeks and we'll see you in April. Yep. Sounds great. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, John, enjoy your camping trip. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I now, will. Do I stop recording, Janet? I just hit, hit the stop recording. Yes. Okay. It says, oh, you're right. It's going to be converted. There you go. Okay. Yes. That's the step I missed. All right, I'm ending it.